Uh, we're going to get into the data center uh, session now and in a little bit, uh, you know, some data center best practices and look at sort of service delivery automation and monitoring. Um, so joining us uh, is Jose uh, Fesse, right? Close enough, right? Yeah. Um, he's a, one of our senior consultants on the data center side of things. So everything Hyper-V, System Center, outside of Configuration Manager. Uh, and, uh, and joining us a little bit later on in the session is Andrew Galt, who's the uh, technical lead or senior technical lead um, on infrastructure gardening, the managed service. Um, he's uh, uh, probably one of our most well-versed, just in general, operate, operating uh, monitoring systems, just enterprise monitoring in general. Um, he comes from IBM Global Services. Uh, he's helped build um, our managed service and um, he'll take you through some of the uh, new features within Ops Manager and how to use them and how to best leverage uh, them using some examples from, uh, from Infrastructure Guardian. Um, so when it comes to uh, the service delivery and automation piece, there's really kind of two sides. Um, there's the service manager piece, uh, which is kind of the, uh, uh, the key piece to this puzzle. It provides all the service delivery um, for your catalog of self-service requests. Um, it also provides um, your ITIL MOF uh, supported frameworks for you know, change management, incident management, problem management. Um, it does release management for, for software releases. Um, and um, you know, it's, that's the one half of the tool. The automation side of that is, uh, is orchestrator. And we'll take a look at that um, once we get through this. We'll kind of take a look at both sides. Um, some of the key features on the service manager side is this idea of a centralized management database. Um, so uh, service manager has connectors into Active Directory, Configuration Manager, Virtual Machine Manager, Exchange, um, the other system center components. Um, and it takes all that information and it consolidates it into a centralized database. Um, so, you know, we take a look at a, a specific device, uh, a server or a desktop, you know, some of the information is stored in Active Directory. The Config Manager client collects other information on the device. Ops Manager agent collects, you know, uh, another set of information. Um, Service Manager pulls all that information into a centralized database and consolidates it. So when I open up that device in Active Directory, as an example, you know, I'll see some basic information, and I'll see a little bit different information in Config Manager, and I'll see a little bit different information in Ops Manager. Service Manager consolidates that also. When I open up the device, I see all this Active Directory information. I see all its Config Manager information. I see all the information that Ops Manager has collected, um, all from uh, a single view. And this centralized management database allows you to build that service catalog and is really what allows um, automation um, to be um, simplified. Now, without a CMDB, you know, we have a tool like Orchestrator tied into you know, all these different databases and all these different services in order to provide that automation. Um, but the CMDB orchestrator just has to tie into Service Manager and everything is housed uh, and stored there and allows me to, um, um, to simplify automation. Um, it also allows me to do much more in-depth reporting because again, instead of having all these various different portals for reporting, um, I can all build it in, uh, in one centralized uh, data warehouse uh, and one centralized report console. Um, so service manager uh, enables self-service in a number of different ways. We saw the portal um, earlier today. Uh, we kind of took you through that, that HR service request and, and, and going through that process. So from an end user perspective, that's, you know, that's the portal that they would use. Um, and then depending on the role in the organization, you know, somebody who's on the, um, you know, the BI side of things, running reports, analyzing data, um, there's a number of different ways. It's all built on SQL, all uses SQL reporting services. So anything that supports SQL reporting services can be used to view those reports and view those dashboards. We can create web parts and publish them to SharePoint. You can use Excel, you can use Crystal Reports, you can use the SQL reporting services website. Um, you can also create reports uh, in SSRS and publish those to the Service Manager console. Uh, there's a number of different ways to consume that data. Um, and then from an ongoing sort of um, interaction process, um, there is there's email um, and other clients. Um, other clients meaning, you know, not just Outlook, but other email um, software, because it is just an email uh, trail going back and forth. Um, with that request that I made earlier, um, one of the things that you'll see is as you go through that, I make that request 
goes off to an approver, the approver gets the email, they can reply to that email saying yes or no. Um, and uh, you know they need to log into a console or go to the SharePoint portal and, and approve that. They can do it via email. Uh, you can also publish the service manager console. So from an IT perspective, you could publish that service manager console using App B or using Zen App, um, and then have you know help desk get access to it via a terminal server, via you know a tablet like an iPad or an Android device. We do have one customer we. Um, sequenced uh, the uh, the service manager console with Zen app, uh, and they published that through Citrix Receiver to iPads, so that their desk side support people don't need to run, you know, three floors down back to their desk to pick up the next ticket and then run back to where they just were to do some desk side support at the you know the office next to where they were just at. They've got their um, their iPad, they open up Citrix Receiver, they have access to the console and they can mark activities as, as complete and close incidents um, without having to sort of run back and forth. Um, funny story, they were all happy that, uh, you know, I remember it was one of the last consulting projects I did. They were all happy, all, everybody in IT was happy because they showed up for work one day and they all had like 3G iPads. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> uh, and then it became evident that the reason why they had 3G iPads is so that they can respond to incidents while they're riding the go train or taking the bus or on the streetcar or something like that so um, be careful what you ask for because you might get it uh, when it comes to this uh, service catalog um, there's really kind of a, a structure to it um, and um, I'm just going to kind of build this out a little bit uh, we saw we saw this uh, some of this uh, this morning um, so as I mentioned the service offering was our HR service offering and within the HR service offering there were a number of different request offerings um, so HR related um, requests um, get bundled up and in there you know we saw a new hire we saw termination we saw vacation requests uh, and it's really just a, a service offering it's just that collection of, of related requests um, within those request offerings there's these um, uh, uh, templates and the templates are really kind of what drive the different processes and we can uh, um, create those um, templates um, and we can use them in various different um, types of, uh, of request offerings. So a, a specific template might be um, you know a Windows update uh, approval template and we can use that uh, or, or sorry not a Windows update but uh, uh, you know a software update change request template that can then be used for deploying you know a new version of an application can be used for deploying um, you know, Windows updates, um, various different types of uh, processes there. And within those templates, that's where we can create those workflows or those processes, um, and that's where we can provide some of the automation. So in that um, request offering, you saw there was two different activities or two different you know, templates. There was the reviewer activity, and there was the, uh, the run book activity to actually create um, that user account. Um, and that's sort of part of those, those templates, and so we can uh, build those out. Um, and that's where we get that, the automation from. Uh, and so this portal catalog, um, it's all SharePoint based, um, and so it's all role based. So I log in, I open up the portal, and I'm logged in with my user credentials, and I'm part of the HR group. I see the HR request offerings and the HR service requests. Uh, I'm not part of HR, maybe I'm part of IT or engineering or I'm just a regular old end user. I get different, um, uh, I get different um, service offerings and request offerings based on the permissions that I have. So as an end user, I might see HR uh, as a service offering, but when I go in there, I'm only going to see vacation requests. I'm not going to be able to do a new hire, I'm not going to be able to fire anybody because I don't have those um, privileges. Uh, those forms are all dynamically generated. Um, you don't need to know SharePoint development to create those because they will show you sort of um, how that's done. It's all done in Service Manager. Um, and then there's a tie-in to the, uh, in, uh, into the uh, CMDB where, you know, a Service Manager knows and we can assign these run books to the various workflows um, in, the, in the different uh, request templates and, and request offerings. Um, and um, because Service Manager has a, a library, has a collection, uh, and knows what run books exist, so I can select the, the run books that, that are available. If it's VM provisioning, I've got a list of the templates that are available 
um, in Virtual Machine Manager as part of my CMDB. I know what users I have. I know what you know. I know all the different hardware and software and all that different configuration that allows me to build that um, service catalog and those service request offerings. Um, and then with Orchestrator tying into that, it's got you know all the information that it needs to provide the automation all in one centralized location. You know, and so if we take a look at you know the add uh, remove user process. Um, when we're adding a, uh, adding a user active directory, there are some things that you know, most organizations will add. You know, everybody's gonna add first name, last name, display name. Everybody should have a password. Um, most places will have a mailbox, whether it's Exchange or something else. You may have link, you may have some group policies that get applied to that. But there's kind of some of the standard things. You know, what we see across the board, outside of maybe link, um, first name, last name, password, exchange, mailbox, group policy, group memberships. Um, those are the various different types of, uh, of information that we would provide um, when we create a, a user. And so there's a number of ways we do that today. Uh, most organizations for the different um, um, user types, they may have a, a, a user, a default user in Active Directory, and they just right click and copy. Uh, and then enter in the unique information and it's a bit of a manual process. Um, but when we take a look at um, you know, expanding that with Service Manager, um, there are some things that can be done uh, to, to sort of enhance that process. Um, I think everybody here has gone through at some point in their career where somebody from HR has come down and said at like four o'clock on a Friday, oh yeah, by the way, Monday morning, nine o'clock, we have uh, so-and-so starting and, you know, they need all their Active Directory stuff. They're going to need a computer, they're going to need a phone, they need a desk set up. And, you know, you end up, you know, working on it until seven o'clock on a Friday to try and get that, to, to get that done. Um, and, you know, a lot of times it is just, yeah, you know, it's January. Just ignore that. Um, there are lots of other activities that, fall into scope of a new user coming on board. And so, you know, when we did the, the workflow this morning, it was pretty straightforward. Here's their Active Directory information. Um, and, and, you know, there's an approval process. So somebody gets an email to approve that hire. Um, and there's some activities then um, that are part of that as, you know, creating the Active Directory account, creating the Exchange mailbox. But outside of that, there are other tasks, right? When you think of somebody being hired, you know, typically in this day and age, they're going to need some sort of computing device, whether it's a notebook or a, or a desktop. Um, most times, you know, we're providing, although this is becoming less, uh, less of an occurrence now because more people are bringing their own mobile devices, but we're providing some sort of mobile device or a plan. Um, payroll needs to be set up, a desk needs to be set up. There's lots of other tasks that IT doesn't take care of. Um, that are part of that new hire process. Uh, and so um, using Service Manager, we can actually expand that. So when somebody goes in, we saw a very basic version of our, our workflow, but we built these processes for, uh, for organizations. Region of York is one. They've got probably one of the bigger Service Manager um, uh, service request environments, um, at least in Ontario, if not Canada, where, you know, they go in and they say, okay, this person, they're starting on this date. Um, they work in this department. This is their salary. Um, they need a mobile device. They need to be on this mobile plan from the four or five mobile plans that, that the region of York, their agreements with Rogers are, you know, we've got these four plans. They need a device, like a, a computing device, and they need a desktop, but they need this particular spec so they have, you know, their four or five desktop and laptop standards you know, listed in there. And so it's very granular. We can go in and, and select everything that they're gonna need, whether they need a desk or they're a mobile user and they need an RSA key because they're gonna be logging in remotely. All of these bits of information are input by HR and then emails are sent off to whoever's responsible for those specific tasks. So, you know, they select, yeah, they need a BlackBerry on this particular Rogers plan email gets sent off to whoever procures that device and sets it up on that, uh, on that Rogers plan. And when that person is done, they just go in and mark their activity as complete. Building maintenance gets an email saying, this person is starting on this date, 
They're a local user, they work in this department, so they need a desk or a cubicle set up in that area. And building maintenance will go in and they'll set it up and they'll mark that activity as complete. HR can go in and they can see the progress and say, okay, a payroll has set up their payroll account. You know, IT has gotten their devices and has gotten their desktop and it's all set up. Building maintenance has set up their desk. How come nobody has done this yet? And they can follow up before that user um, starts and say, hey, you know, just as a reminder, um, this needs to be done. Um, and then all the, you know, Exchange, Link, Active Directory, all those types of accounts can be provisioned automatically um, via orchestrator. Um, so it really kind of allows you to go beyond just, oh, well, you know, I need to go in and I need to, uh, uh, you know, I need to go in Active Directory and create a user account and create a mailbox. Um, it goes much further beyond um, that process. Um, some of the other things we gain with using Service Manager is um, there's a history of everything that's taken place. So when you know that user shows up on Monday morning and something hasn't been done, you know we can go and we can look in that service request and see what hasn't been done and who didn't do it, who was supposed to, you know, kind of fell asleep and, and didn't do their particular job. You know, or if something was done wrong and we, you know, six months from now we realize, hey, this person should have been part of this group too. Um, go back and see why weren't they part of that group or why weren't they given that access. Um, so we have this history of, uh, of, um, uh, of what's been done. Uh, and by default, it's three years. So we can go back uh, as far as three years to find out you know, what happened and, and you know, who did what, when did this person start. You know? Did somebody, you know, did HR put a typo in when they said that person should get, you know, you know, hundred thousand dollars a year when maybe they should have gotten one hundred and ten or ten, you know, whatever it is, right? We can see all that information. We have that that that, that history of activities, um, all, all the tasks, uh, you know, um, really allows both end users and IT staff to provide and and deliver some advanced. Uh, capabilities without needing the keys to the kingdom, right? So from a user, from an HR perspective, HR can do this um, and automatically provision those accounts in Active Directory without ever having any domain cr uh, credentials um, because of the run as accounts and the different service accounts and action accounts that are created so that, you know, they can go in and they can request an application and when it's approved, you know, SCCM uses its account to deliver that application without the user needing local or admin uh, credentials. So it really allows you to um, um, give that power to end users, give that power to you know your level one, uh, level two help desk, without kind of giving them those dreaded domain admin credentials, which uh, you know uh, can cause all sorts of issues in the wrong hands. Um, and then through those templates and through those service requests and the run books that we have in Orchestrator, we can provide consistent. You know, time after time, that new hire process is exactly the same. Nothing is going to get missed um, because of the way we can design those forms. Virtual machines are going to get deployed. Applications are going to get rolled out in the exact same manner every single time because we have those dedicated design um, workflows for those typical scenarios. So with that, um, I'm going to bring up Jose. Uh, Jose is going to go through the first half of this service delivery uh, demo. Again, taking you through what we saw with Service Manager this morning um, and, and creating that HR request and then looking at sort of the back end side of things with the approval, how those forms are created in, uh, in Service Manager and, uh, and, and, and you know, sort of the end to end process of, uh, of provisioning a new user. So they have seen the process? I went through the uh, form, so it's there. There's an approval waiting for approval. Okay, which I just deleted because I thought oh. it was from last All right, time. Well, That's fine. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the next demo will kind of go through the automation side of things and how that set up. Okay. So I think what Ronnie went through, but not with this user, I think we went through with the regular user, right? So we went through this form of human resources for a new user. So new hire, termination, vacation request, that's what we have here. Uh, you guys seen this in the parameters that we have here, um, simple things. So was a, this was a, is a basic implementation. So like Ronnie says, we did some others that are require a little bit more 
even um, I'm coming from a recent one that um, we not only automated that, the IT part, but we automated the HR part of the process, which actually became um, uh, something that we're not expecting, so com complex that was, right? So, so it's one of the, the rules that, I, that I, I wrote here as a, as a general rule for a service manager. Sometimes the processes are much more complex than they look, right? So a new simple new hire uh, form from HR uh, requires a lot of automation in the back to, to, to mimic exactly what people do in the real life, all the, all the tasks that they do. But uh, fortunately, we can do that. So um, this, um, I'm not sure, so it should um, request a new one or should be back here. What we uh, saw this morning is, uh, so that's what we came for us. Did you complete? So this is from the 18, this is old stuff, so they didn't, it's not exactly new, so we should maybe go through this again. So, do you remember what you used today for, uh, I, I don't think that was the user that you used, probably no, not mine, you used Alex, right? Or? Yeah, I didn't use your user account because I don't know your password. Okay. Uh, Feel free to share it with me. You know what the password is. Right? So, okay, let's pretend we don't. Um, I think we, we may have a user called John Doe, so we have any suggestion. Bob Smith is taken, so. Choose my name. Okay. Okay, let's bring in a user. So Andrew's gonna work for us. All right, so IT, I think it makes sense. So let's put any number. So those forms are, are, are ready to format. Yeah, so what's your whole phone number? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Um, let's use the uh, typical Hollywood phone number, right? So let's take it server operator, server manager, whatever. So we can pick multiple here. So I think Ronnie may have talked, uh, may have said that, but all that information that we see in there, that, that's coming from AD. And a service manager has connected to all different, all sorts of products from Microsoft and some other third parties like Exchange, uh, SCOM, service manager. So, sorry, uh, configuration manager. We can bring that information and, and keep the consistency among the, uh, uh, in the requests and everything. So when I'm, I'm referring to computers, there are actually, I, of course, I could put a free typing field there, but I'm actually bringing computers or users or software or virtual machine templates that are coming from the real products in, 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 in the environment. So it will keep the consistency and the relationship among them, right? So um, I can pick this. So let's say this is not actually attaching and that will have a picture from under here. So um, so let's make it, who's going to be the manager? Could be user HR. And we decided to make this, uh, some of these decisions here. So what the phone number will be, um, the group membership and, and those little things. Let me submit this, uh, something that we're actually asking the users. But most of the time, what we would do is depending on certain, certain information, like for example, the office for that user or something like that, I can make the background infrastructure decide for me. So if that user is, belongs to the Canada office, I can, okay, here's the list of groups that I should add a user to, and that, that, that doesn't need to be asked. So I really automate what pe somebody sitting at the Active Directory console say, okay, this guy's from Canada, so I'm gonna put him and this and this and this group because of this, because of that. So that's, that's what's gonna happen in the background. So I think the idea here is show you guys how, how, is, the, how is it done, right? So this is or this and then this. I should have it here, so service. Is it the service manager that's running the actual task or is it orchestrator running a run look or? A little bit of both, right? So the, the, actual, um, the actual portal is part of service manager, right? This is managed by service manager. So that's something that's completely integrated. We're, we're gonna see now, so what's in the background of service manager that creates this dynamically. Uh, but for certain activities, what actually goes to AD, right? And, and creates the user in AD, I'm leveraging orchestrator to do that, right? So even for um, these processes that I was uh, mentioning before, we actually, Part of it was just the, the HR thing that I mentioned before. We used Orchestrator because we, we had some, such a level of complexity in terms of notifications for one example, right? So 
if it was a new position or a replacement, the type of notification would be completely different. In this case, I should notify the HR or a certain in orchestrator allow me to make this as complex as it as it can, right? So, Excuse me. sure. If you're using this to do something like uh, provision of the YAML, mm -hmm. right, instead of this HR type thing, yes, um, it's it it is designed or it knows enough to 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 pick out who you are when you come to the portal, so you don't yes. have to enter that. And then if it if that information if the information's within AD, it can say, okay, this goes to your manager, who is this person, exactly. pull that out of AD and and send it on that type of stuff. Yes, that's smart enough. There's there's more than one mechanism to do that. The, the most simple one that you can use, and I'm going to show it in the, in the console, but um, it is that service manager has an option when I, whenever I create a re review activity or an approval activity, I can pick, say, that for that activity, the line manager of the user requesting should approve. So it's the simplest way that I can do. Of course, it could be simpler to manually say who's the approval. Uh, we have customers that certain activities, it's like, it's always the same person that approves. Sometimes it's dynamic in that sense. So the line manager, whoever is set in AD as the manager of that person. And for the ones that I, that I implemented recently, uh, it would completely depend on the case. So a new position would be uh, the manager of the person that was request. No, there was, was, well, there was a lot of complexity in terms of the process. Then I can go and set. So in this case, the approver will be this person, but that will be a little bit more manual process Many are not in the sense that the user requesting is going to do it, but orchestrator will make a decision for you. And right? it can do multiple approvers as well. Yes, and then you can set also the criteria, unanimous or at least 60%, 50%. So I'm going to show, um, this is the MMMF, right? So what is my service manager console? There you go. So let's take a look at this, this particular, did you show the template then? No, this, no, this market? I show it in that form. Okay, perfect. So you're going to see the back end of um, this resolution is good enough for us to see. So. The, um, so the basics um, of this will be we have, we'll have a template for every, each and every uh, automated activity and templates <coughs> for the actual uh, process as a whole. And then what we s you saw in the portal as the request offers and the service offerings, right? Um, when I think about the library, that's what we're going to be working on here. Um, we have a service catalog, which is basically what you saw in the portal. So I say that I have the, some published offers here, offerings here, and they're basically the same that we saw there. There's the new hire, right? That's the one that we saw. And in order to create that, I, I previously created a template, which I'm going to show right after that. I just want to show how you actually build that interface uh, in the portal, right? So this is the actual form that you see? Each yeah, point. this will be the form. Of course, I picked the simple things, like the, the, even the icon here, and, and the template that's here, you're going to see right after this. And I said, well, here's the thing that I need to ask, right? Basically, how origin, first name, middle name, last name, I, what type of things are lists sync a hard code the list is in the request list created inside service manager and query results which are basically things coming from any objects that exist inside service manager including uh, service requests themselves i implemented one process that would have two phases so i completed a service request and then it was just like waiting for the second phase and in the second phase would list me a it would give me a list of service requests previously approved so I'm going to continue this one. So I can pick any, basically any object inside Service Manager for that. And then when I configure, I basically say how the format's going to look. If it's a string, if it's a text, for example, the phone number, I, I pick a certain type of um, uh, format, phone numbers, 10 digits. I could even use a regular expression if I wanted to, uh, if something very special. Um, uh, you would like to save your edit? No, I don't want to save it. Uh, for the query results, I'm bringing properties of an object that exists, which is basically a, um, the resolution doesn't help, but it says down here that it's uh, Active Directory user right here. And I'm picking even some criteria. I can bring, bring for example, objects from a certain OU or wherever, from a certain criteria. Display which I'm going to show the users and how I'm going to handle the actual information. That doesn't really matter right now but it's gonna be stored. 
but that's interesting because this is going to be stored as an, a, a related object um, uh, inside the service request. So we can actually see the object there. So it doesn't really matter right now. Um, and then I map them and then I publish. I can even um, relate to knowledge articles saying that, for example, for this offer, there's like three, five, ten uh, knowledge articles that I created for example, explaining how this is done, how this process works. So when the user comes to the portal, he sees, oh, there's three knowledge articles that I should read and explaining how, how, it's, how it's done or depending on how complex. So there was no, basically, no, no, no required knowledge of SharePoint here to build that interface. So that's built from here. As you saw there, there was a template that was referred, which was the new hire uh, template here, new hire template. And the template basically, besides uh, not only uh, fills up f uh, fields in a request inside Service Manager, right, like the title, the description, and things like that, but it also describes how the process goes. This is very simple, right? So this is just it's saying there's a re review activity right here that should happen before anything happens, right, and. Uh, and what it is, is basically saying that certain user here, in this case, we hard code the user, the admin HR is the one that's gonna approve this, right? Uh, the condition has to be unanimous. And I'm not using the, re the, the this resource here, but uh, I could use the line manager should review, right? So service manager basically adds the, the line manager automatically to this list of reviewers, right? And like you said, there's some other types of percentage automatic, right? Oh, and the, and, the, and the threshold here. So in this case, this will need to happen unless this happens, what comes after this won't happen, of course. And we have customers that have much more complex ones. So a list of uh, manual activities, like what Rodney mentioned, for example, a provisioning the computer, uh, the desk or telephone or whatever, right? Those people when assigned, automatically or manually, right? They will get an email, say, well, you have an, act an activity to be uh, uh, completed and they can reply completed when it's completed, right? So this is a very simple one, but there will be a much more complex, uh, can be a lot more complex here. And of course, there's a template for the actual runbook activity, which refers to orchestrator we're gonna see uh, in the second thing. But what I wanna show before we go with this is that I should have, uh, there's a new hire approval for me here. I am admin HR, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm in, this, in this window, I am the approver. So I get an email like this, there's a submitted for your review. I have basically two options. One is click here and go to the portal where it sits there and approve it. Or I can write or just reply to that saying that is approved. Which is very convenient from from a mobile point of view, right? So it's going to be on a small window, small phone. I can just do that. That's going to uh, make the process go on and um, continue. And then it's going to run the actual automation and create the user and do the, uh, the other things. And also um, before, well, well, I think that's fine. Before I go, just a few notes about this. Uh, I've been doing this um, processes, so this implementation of processes recently, and uh, I came up with a few a list of a few things that we shouldn't miss. So as as an, as notes, this these things usually um, we require a lot of planning. They're not simple, not as simple as uh, operations manager installations that we all them, we're talking about processes that people. There's a lot of people involved. So we de definitely need to plan them uh, beforehand. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's very easy to, um, to create things inside Service Manager, but changing them after. And, and basically, because we're creating classes and objects with properties, technically, it's pretty hard to simply, OK, no, I don't, I, I'm going to change the name of this field right away. Not that simple. We're adding data. So once that's implemented, um, we hope that was very well planned before we start deploying or start using that. I think I mentioned before, never underestimate a, what, what looks like a simple process, right? We had this customer which was supposed to automate four forms. You look at them on the, in, on the internet, they're very simple. 
uh, so far it took us like, a, I don't know, 40 business days and there's still things to be worked on because uh, when it comes to another point, there's always change and then uh, it, it, there's a lot of people uh, giving ideas and uh, a lot of improvement wants to happen naturally. And then uh, unless you face the process, you're, you're doomed to work forever uh, in, in, in those processes. And that's um, something that you don't want to do, right? Um, and, and very usually the processes are not completely, completely mapped out. You're gonna find a folder on the internet with some visual files, but they're usually outdated, right? And it, they, they need to be at least updated if not completely reviewed. Um, another thing that we learned, Service Manager works pretty well from an inter interface perspective for, for IT. For end users, we need to make sure that we will have all the requirements uh, from a, from a uh, cloud automation perspective, even IT doing its thing or, or providing simple interfaces for HR, for example, works pretty well. Depending on how complex the needs of the user, the end user is, that, that the limitations, uh, limitations of the, the web parts and SharePoint can be a bit of an issue. So there at least minimal will be some ad adaptation from the, from the customers. Um, and of course, documentation. And we're gonna be creating a lot of, uh, very often a lot of new classes, new customizations on all these objects, even the service requests and stuff. So unless you document that, you're gonna it, very quickly, you're gonna be lost in all the changes and little things that you do to make, to, to, you know, to really implement what you have in, the, in the, the current process or whatever you wanna do is new. So unless you document those things very, very, very clearly, you're gonna be lost very soon, right? So we're gonna continue the process right after this, so. Yeah, so the orchestrator's running in the background now to kind of do what it needs to do and, and, and we'll kind of let that happen. And so uh, just to kind of uh, reiterate some of those best practices, um, you know, you need to define the process and the workflow uh, and, and you need to stick to it. Uh, it's one of those things, it's like software development a little bit where people, you know, you throw a hundred people in the room and you have a hundred ideas um, and a hundred features that should be implemented. Uh, and, you know, eventually that software will never ever get written because everybody just says, hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? And so having a defined process and a defined workflow um, and, and have that sort of test dev QA uh, and then production type of implementation where you can go through that process of improving the, 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 the workflows while you have something in place. Um, and what we found too, you know, is, is, um, is having a business analyst, somebody who understands the business side of things and the requirements from that business side of things. You know, IT is great with the infrastructure and setting things up, um, but they don't always uh, understand the business processes and the business side of things. Um, and as we sort of get into things, what we'll see in the next little bit is, is all around leveraging off, uh, Orchestrator to expand, you know, what Service Manager can do, integrating it into other, you know, sort of non-Microsoft solutions. So Orchestrator ties into VMware. So if you're using this for, um, you know, self-service for virtual machines, but you've got a VMware environment, that's okay. You know, or you've got, uh, you know, you're doing this so that users can, um, um, you know, you know, deploy applications, but you're using Alteris and not Configuration Manager, you know, things like that are okay, um, um, thanks to Orchestrator. Um, so we've talked a little bit about Orchestrator. Orchestrator is really, you know, a workflow automation tool. Um, I call it scripting for dummies. Um, you can create, uh, I don't, don't want to say the word easily, um, but more easily than writing a BB or a PowerShell script, um, you can create some fairly complex um, automation uh, run books um, simply by dragging and dropping, um, configuring some connections to various um, systems um, and providing uh, some basic information. You can create some fairly, you know, um, uh, some fairly complex um, run books fairly easily. Um, uh, and so, you know, you can use Visio you can create run books um, for the most part. It, you know, your only limitation there is, is sort of, you know, your knowledge and, and your capabilities. Um, I did a, a, a training course for Microsoft on Opal, and we had one of our um, 
competitors um, send a couple of their consultants to this thing. It was three days of training, and at the end of the three days, you know, the consultant asked, he's like, so, you know, do I have, every, do I know everything I need to know about deploying orchestrator? It's like, well, deploying orchestrator is like, for the slowest of the slow, you know, four hours. You know, if you can build a Windows server and you can click next, 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 finish, you can deploy orchestrator. Out of the box, it does absolutely nothing. You know, until you start building those run books to automate specific tasks, it just sits there consuming CPU cycles and memory and disk space. Um, so deploying orchestrator is fairly straightforward. Um, uh, and the only real limitation is, you know, it's kind of your imagination and, and your skill set as far as how far you can take that. Um, and the data bus uh, is one of those things that really kind of allows some of the more advanced options and we'll kind of cover off what, um, what that is. Um, there's a couple of uh, um, concepts here. A activities, um, these are the sort of standalone one-off things that Orchestrator can do. Um, so an activity is like, well, you know what, I want Orchestrator to monitor SCOM, right? And so it's going to look at SCOM and it's going to look for a specific alert. Um, or I want it to connect to a web service, or I want it to run a SQL query. Uh, and so those are all the different types of things. I'll listen to an example of an activity. Another activity might be run this script, restart this service, um, you know, send this email. Those are kind of the ideas of the activity. So they're one-off, you, know, uh, um, um, you know, actions that we would execute. Um, and then tying those actions together is what gives you a run book. And so there's a number of built-in activities, you know, run the .NET script, you know, SSH connect connection, um, you know, query a database, um, you know, invoke a web service. Those are some of the basic ones that are built in. Um, there's integration packs that you can download then. Some of them are free, some of them you pay for. Um, Microsoft has integration packs for all the System Center uh, 2012 and pre-2012 components. Um, there's integration packs for, you know, um, H, uh, the HP uh, it service desk or service management tool, uh, BMC, the various BMC, um, you know, service desk tools, um, and, you know, VMware, backup utilities. Um, there's a number of different integration packs that you can import um, that allow you to do additional activities outside of those standard things. The run books is basically the... the connection of activities. So you drag all the various activities, you, you define your process, what happens, you drag the activities and then you link them together, much like you would do in Visio. Um, Jose will show you when he gets into the demo. It's uh, uh, fairly straightforward in, in, uh, in that regard. Uh, the data bus is used to uh, uh, allow for some of more advanced uh, execution. So. If we were to take a look at you know, creating a run book to monitor SCOM for an alert of, let's say, a service failure. Uh, and when that service failure happens, you know, we want to run this .NET script. Maybe it's a PowerShell script just to restart the service. Right? So let's say we're going to monitor uh, um, IIS, the application pool. When the application pool crashes on a server, we're going to run IIS reset. Simple reset and then if it was successful, write to the event log. If it's unsuccessful, we're going to um, uh, you know, send an email so that somebody takes a look at it. Uh, and so thanks to the data bus, you know, we can monitor for that alert. Um, and when that alert is triggered, so when you know, the application pool crashes and it creates an alert in um, uh, Operations Manager, Orchestrator will see that. And all that information associated with that alert gets written to the data bus. So what's the name of the application pool? What service is it running, or what server is it running on, uh, as an example? And other things that would be included in that alert, like the time that it happened, you know, how often does it happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then that next activity can read from that service bus and say, okay, well, I need to run IIS reset. Well, which app pool do I run it against and which server? Well, I can pull all that information from the data bus. And then when it was successful or when it failed, you know, the, the results of that activity then get written to the data bus so that when it was successful, well, we can just write to the event log and, well, what do I want to write to the event log? Well, I have all the information from those previous activities in the data bus so I can say, well, SCOM triggered this alert at this time on this application pool on this server. We ran this script 
against that server and that application pool, the result was success, and I can write that to that event log into storage. Or vice versa, it failed, and I have all that information, and I can dump that into an email, and I can send that email to, uh, to an individual. And so all that information is, is, is stored in that data bus, and it really kind of allows you to um, 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 create more generalized scripts. So I don't need a script for, well, when this app pool crashes on this server, that's one runbook, but when this app pool crashes on this server, it's a different runbook. It allows us to create one runbook. Um, that uh, um, you know provides automation for you know a, a, a larger set of resources, and so uh, that's what a runbook is. Uh, basically, a list of individual steps, um, and that's your uh, that's your recipe, uh, that's your workflow for for the automation. Um, when we look at that add user process um, or delete user process, uh, you know there's a lot of sort of options. Like, how am I going to add the user? What information am I adding? You know, am I putting in first name, last name, line manager? Um, where am I getting that information from? Um, and do I create a link account? Do I create an exchange mailbox? There's a lot of different things that um, come into play. And this is where, again, when we talk about best practices, is it's one thing to know how to create an Active Directory account and a mailbox and a link account and all that. It's another thing to know what's happening when you're doing that. What are all the pieces of information that you need? You need to know that before you can actually create, uh, you know, before you can actually configure the activity to create the account, you need to know all that information. And before that, well, where am I getting that information from? You know, am I you know, reading a text file or is that information input into a service request in Service Manager? Or is it, you know, am I just emailing it to the system, like where does that information come from? And then all the sort of steps along the way. Well, okay, I created an Active Directory user and I populated Active Directory with all this information and it was successful so I can move on to the next step. And if it was unsuccessful, because let's say we created a, an account for a user named Bob Smith, but we already have a Bob Smith. What should Orchestrator do? Should it fail? Probably not. You know, we could put a loop in there and say, well, if it failed, try this, try Bob, middle initial Smith, try Bob Smith 2, try all these different combinations um, before failing, right? And then what's the next step? Well, okay, well now we're gonna create an exchange mailbox. Well, there's a whole bunch of information that's required there, right? And so really understanding what, not only what the process is, but all the steps in between and where we're getting that information from um, um, is important. And when we start tying into other activities, you know, is there an integration pack for that? You know, like Jose was, had a customer where, you know, they had everything in JD Edwards, and when JD Edwards was updated, they wanted to update Active Directory. Well, there's no integration pack for JD Edwards and Orchestrator. Nobody's created one. So what do you do? Well, how can I get this information out of Orchestra, uh, out of JD Edwards? There must be some way in JD Edwards to spit that out into some sort of file format. And then can I build something custom so that when this file gets output by JD Edwards, that orchestrator sees that, takes that information, does what it does, and updates Active Directory. And so there's a lot of times where, you know, can I, can I build it? It's not there, you know, it's not something that I can just download and install and click, 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 next, 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 finish. Um, is it something that I can build? And as the sales guy, I'm like, yes, we can build it. <laughs> All depends on what you want to spend. Jose doesn't like it when I say things like that because he's the guy who actually has to go out there and figure it out. But as the sales guy, yes, we can. Can you um, put him in on the moon? Hmm? Can you put him in on the moon? Yes, we can. Sure. Two days. How much money do you want to spend? <laughs> That's right. or how much money do you have to spend? I want to be one hundred percent. Right. And and, and so uh, and so that's you know that's where you know. Um, and that then comes into a different conversation with us. But yes, you can do it. It might not be the best thing to do, right? We had another conversation with the customers. It's like, I've got like this seven exchange, you know, server uh, deployment. Um, you know, I've got DAGs, I've got, you know, CAS servers, I've got mailbox servers, I've got, you know, uh, hub transports and all this kind of stuff. I just want to be able to go into WSUS and approve exchange updates. And I want Orchestrator to fail everything over and do all the load balancing and patch everything and you know all that automatically. 
like, yeah, but, oh, and never mind that, you know, F5 load balancers and all this other stuff sitting in front. Yeah, you can do that. We could build an automation sequence to do that. And when we looked at all the different components and everything like that, it's going to be, you're looking at, you know, to do testing and ongoing maintenance and all that stuff, you're looking at, I think it was like sixty or $70,000 worth of work effort just to patch these seven servers automatically. For $70,000, you could hire some kid <laughs> from Ryerson or, or somewhere you can, you know, you know, hire IG to do it for a lot less, you know, for this, you know, for IG to come in once a month, look at the updates that you've approved and go through and have one of our knock analysts go through and manually fail things over and, and, and patch the systems and make sure everything's okay. So you don't want to just, you know, patch exchange and fingers crossed, hopefully everything works. Um, because, uh, you know, as Andrew can probably tell you, you know, a lot of times they don't work. And then if something changes in your exchange environment, now you're spending who knows how much money to update your orchestrator workflow. So it didn't, uh, yes, you can. It's not always the right thing to do. Um, through Orchestrator, we do gain uh, um, some things. Again, there's a, a digital trail. There's a, a log of, of everything that's happened and how the activities were success or failure or things like that. Um, you know, we can, uh, a lot of those repetitive tasks um, can get eliminated. There's a lot of low hanging fruit in your environment where this happens on a semi-occasional basis and when it does, you log in, you do this, you do that, and it's fixed for another period of time, um, you know, random period of time. Um, I, so I run a, a website and I moved it to WordPress a couple years ago, but before that it was running on, on, on something else, I don't remember what it was called, um, and somewhere around the two and a half to three hour mark, um, the application pool would crash. Uh, and I'd need to log into the server and run IIS reset and everything was fine. Um, after a while, I just created a scheduled task that every two hours, restart, you know, run IIS reset every two hours and the website ran for years perfectly fine. Uh, there's things like that, right? That um, you don't have the time, the energy, the effort, the knowledge to fix whatever the problem is or it's not a high priority. You know, so we have this script and when this service fails, I log in, I run this script and boom, it's fixed. Uh, things like that that can be easily automated. Um, the thing with automation is it's nice because every single time we know exactly what's going to happen. Run books don't just magically change unless somebody checks it out, modifies it, and checks it back in. So uh, every single time we run this workflow to create a new user account and a new mailbox, the exact same process happens. Um, so we have that consistency and that predictability so we know exactly what's happening. Every time a VM gets provisioned, it gets provisioned in the same manner. So nothing ever gets changed. Because I might go in and create an Active Directory user one way. Andrew will log in, he'll create it, it'll be a little bit different. And Jose is gonna log in and it's gonna be a little bit different. And everybody in this room will go through and it will be using the same tool and the same method to create an Active Directory account. But every time it might be just a little bit different. Um, and so Orchestrator really kind of um, gets rid of that. And finally, you know, we've got a lot of systems that are, you know, not integrated. So JD Edwards and Active Directory, there's no integration there, but we can integrate that. Um, you know, um, Ops Manager and, uh, uh, and BMC Remedy, uh, there are some plugins there, but we can, you know, add some additional automation um, thanks to Orchestrator. Uh, we're going to get into the other half of this and so Jose went through and we created that form and he's requested the new user. It's been approved. Now Orchestrator has gone through and it's done its thing to create that account. And so Jose, Jose will actually take you through the run book and you can kind of see and, and you'll get an understanding of A, how we just drag and drop and make these workflows, but B, how you really need to understand the process so we can see all the different steps that it actually takes to create uh, an Active Directory account. So I was uh, recently this, this long weekend uh, I was at um, Legoland and reminded me a lot of orchestrator, right? Because that that's a little bit of putting the little pieces together and building something. Um, so I really think my son is ready for this. So he's he spent like three or four hours being building those little cars and going down the 
the little lane. So, and you should see the parents there. They're much, more, <coughs> much more fierce than the kids. Here's a, here's a new home, right? Go, go, where are you going to win? That was a little bit like that. So I really, um, really remind me of that. So um, before we look at this, I, I really like Orchestrator for two reasons. Big ones is uh, consistency, like Rodney said. This always happens at the same time, even though the run book that we're going to see has contingency. So if you remember the process that we put together, first tries, first letter, and then last name of the user. If that exists, then it's going to try first letter, first letter of the middle name, and then last name, and then first name, last name two, and first name, last name, oh, first letter, last name three. That's what it does. So there's some contingency in case of, that it already exists. And the other thing that I love is the, is the, the, the data bus. Right, so because we can actually reuse and uh, the information that's already, it's already that's already there. Um, let's make. Um, I think that's the one we're looking for. So with this resolution, it became a little small, but um, so this is being this is one type of run box. They're all the same, but uh, there's basically two or three different situations where you use them. This one particularly is triggered by Service Manager. So there's one way to use run books, right? So when that activity kicks off and, and it's been approved, then the next activity comes off in, in Service Manager, this starts. And that's exactly where those things start. When I start my run book, I say, well, here's what the information that I need. I need that first name, the title, middle name, the expiration date, and that's being mapped from whatever the user typed in that service request to here. And there's another one thing here that's very important. This is Sounds very techy and geeky, but um, this is the actual ID of the object, the run book activity that's there. And that's one, uh, that's the start point. Besides all the information that I have, I can start going through the, the run book and I have access to the actual activity here and it's all its parameters, everything that was existing there. And then I can, with it, I can get this relationship to the actual service request which contains that activity. With that, I can get access to whatever the user typed in an XML format, and then I run a little PowerShell here, and I get that into, uh, the, I think I'm, we're putting this into the description field or in the notes field, I believe, uh, of the service request. So it's some sort of summary for whatever the user requested. And then actually, the, here it is, we update the notes in the service request. And here's what the, where the, uh, the uh, data bus comes in. Right, when I'm here, I'm actually saying, just get that service request, which I basically fetched before, and make the notes field the output of the previous, which is actually that uh, extract user input activity. So I can reuse, if I decided not to use this, I can go back to the first activity. Instead of this, I want to put the last name of the user here. It doesn't make any sense, but what I'm trying to say is that you have access to anything or all the information that was produced before right, uh, in, in the run book. So when at this point, I actually update, just updated the uh, nodes. And then I start con just controlling how many attempts I'm going to do, attempt zero. And then I'm calling another run book, which really reminds of uh, <coughs> software development, right? At this point with the project that we've been doing, I, I have my, my own folder that I can export and import at the customer where I call my run book library with a lot of little run books that do certain things. Right, that I can just basically import there and get them handy to be used, like sending multiple notifications to user if I need to. And then I just put in there and I can call them. This is here in another, this, this run book here particularly is in another folder. Let me see, which is, this guy is called attempt to create an ID account, right? It's in the uh, procedure folder. Alex likes to call them procedure. Then it's another run book with its parameters as if it was like a development function, right? I started to build them and reuse them, right? When I come here, I get the, the run book activity, I get, I get the properties of the user, I format the data and get the direct manager from, and then I, I try to create the user. If that works, so there was no uh, problem with that, I can I just update that. I fetch, you, did the user pick, uh, uh, Yes, to enable the user right away. That was a question in the in the um, in the actual form. So if yes, I enable the user. If not, I just return the data. 
If that fails, I'm going to return as a failure, and then when going back to the run book, it's going to try it again. I'm going to put that into a loop until the attempts are at four in this case, right? If it goes over four, and then it's um, it's just because it's failed completely, and then uh, if it all works in the end here, I enable the mailbox, which is an activity that's calling to exchange really here. And then I create the mailbox, update it, generate a file, uh, file, well, this is a temporary thing. In the end, I add the user to a group. Um, just some controls here. In the end, I update the service notes with the final results. I delete the file and uh, temporary file and I'm done, right? So that, uh, or if all else fails, I'm filling the run book and just writing some information. Uh, well, it's just a control here in general. But, uh, I think there was something Ad Ad Alex added in the end just for yeah, testing, so right? Yeah, so it's, we're still building this environment, but that I think that does everything that we need. So as you see, uh, that's why I call Legos those little pieces together. They, they reach out to different systems here, if you can probably see here. So I have connections to virtual machine manager, service manager, operations manager, exchange from ad admin perspective, from a user perspective. So I basically can do create mailbox here, uh, create a request, create a remote mailbox, disable mailbox, enable, uh, and then I can, ex from a user perspective, I, I can send emails, create items, and so it's and that. Um, and then can reach out to Active Directory and some utilities, creating files, managing log files, reading line by line. And Orchestrator also manages the, when you have, for example, you read a file, have multiple lines, wherever comes after that activity, it's going to run n times, depending on number of lines, for example which can be very tricky, like Rodney says, it's fairly easy, but there's a lot of little pitfalls that you can fall. You know, an example that I like to, uh, I, I like to talk about is a uh, customer that well, we were building this together. I built one and he decided to test it, right? And built the, uh, the Zabo AD account one. And if you don't do it uh, properly, when you fetch users from AD, um, it's probably somewhere here. I get the user, when you get the user from AD, you have to set a filter. So the user principal name is something. If you forget this and you run this, this will get you all your users, right? And that's what happened. So can you imagine what, what it, it stopped at the 30 or 40 out of 600 because it disabled the user that was disabling the user. Oh, right. the active account. Yeah, actually, the Active Directory account that was used. So it was, he was lucky enough, Oops. right? When we imagine like 80,000 users, all of a sudden, all disabled, right? Of course, you could run this and put enable right after, and you, but it would enable everybody, right? So there's little things that you have to know if you don't do this. It's whatever comes after that's going to happen 10 or 80,000 times. So like a function, same thing, right? Very specific. Yeah. No. So, um, so going back, so that this one simple one, uh, another type of runbook. So this was triggered from Service Manager. The ones that another type is um, monitors, right? I think we have one recreated here. I think we're doing. No, I think I'm going to create a new one. So this is a typical example. So th this is monitoring certain types of uh, requests here in certain types of objects. So those run books, this one is stopped, but it could actually be running. You can monitor a certain type of object, but in this case, it's a very, something very weird, there, extension of incident, something that we extended the class, right? But it could be monitoring, for example, an alert on, on our operations manager. Let's create a new one here, just quickly example here. Right, let's create this run book and let's bring from operations manager, let's monitor an alert, right? I want to check it out. So I'm going to connect to my SCOM here and a new alert, which um, I don't know, the description contains heartbeat or heartbeat. So that's probably not a good idea, but it's just, right? So there's how it works. And if that happens, so if something, and then I'll, I'll check this out, check it in, or sorry, run it. It's going to be monitoring any alerts on, on, on operations manager that have. And once that's triggered, 
right? I can do something. For example, I don't know, uh, I could run PowerShell script uh, right here. And in the PowerShell script, or Java or C Sharp or whatever I want, I could do something, test equals, let's make it nice, and then something what? Um, publish data, for example, that wanted to alert my description, or maybe not, maybe the NetBIOS, NetBIOS computer name. And then I could test it, like trying to ping it, for example. If that pings fail, I can return a value here and say, if that pings fail, or I can do, let's do start stop the service. All right, let's make this restart that service on which computer Oh, I know the computer, oh, sorry. I don't want to pick a computer from here, from the network. I want to actually go and bring the computer from here again. So, NetBIOS computer name, and which service? Well, in this case, I don't actually have the service, but it could be a parameter of my alert, right? Service name or whatever, depending on what it is. Uh, it could be, if I monitor something very specific, it could be, uh, we're starting the spooler service or whatever, any parameters, anything. So yeah, okay. And then, this. and then I can build as much more complex responses to certain events, right? So, uh, and reach out to something, send an email if that fails, uh, writing a log file, writing to a SQL database, anything that I can reach from here. And we actually didn't add all of them here. There, there's more, much more, uh, uh, integration packs that we can add here, but that the idea is that we can use Orchestrator to as a you know reach out to all the products and but much build much more complex uh, responses. Um, In run books, all of the other run books. Yes, I think you were you I just came back. Yeah, just yeah quickly I'll show you here. That's what actually the one that we use for provisioning. We're actually calling another one here, oh, okay. yeah. right? And sometimes it's the only way, practical way to do it. Uh, I had an example, I think it was exactly the one that was uh, importing the data from JD Edwards that Rodney mentioned. I was going through, uh, no, that one is automated. There was something else. Oh yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember. But it was something that I had to read a file line by line. And in the end, if I, what happens, that's what happens. You, whatever comes after I'm reading the file happens X times depending on number of lines. But I wanted to make it in the end to, I, I had an option of junction in the orchestrator, but in that context, it didn't happen. So what I had to do in the end is create another run book that's called, in that one, it, all the X times happens, comes back, and then I could write a log file with the results of what happened in the end, right? So you have to, one way or another, get, uh, get a groove on how things work in orchestrator. It looks very simple in the beginning, but it's, um, it, once you know what's going on, how the, all those activities, and sometimes you have to set, uh, for example, authentication and PowerShell can be tricky or maybe because you're running things remotely, so you have to know how to set up the authentication remotely when, when you have to do it. Uh, but um, it's pretty uh, reasonable to, to start without any knowledge of uh, scripting, basically. Still have to know how the classes and stuff. So the, usually the first time that we talk to somebody in detail about this. The first two hours are a little bit fuzzy. So people, you know, get a little bit, well, how those, and, and even mainly when you add the service manager to the equation. But um, after that, once you, you get the groove, what's, what's going on, what, what the information is coming from, it, it starts to get more natural to, to work with the, uh, with the activities, right? Um, your question, that's one of Microsoft's recommendations is, this is a big complex, mm -hmm. Um, workflow. Um, there's actually to split it up. Split it up. Well, I was thinking about the example because of matching like an exchange. A, a while while they they build up on that task. It also allows you to um, uh, to do things like uh, reuse some things, right? So you can write a run book to do a notification, um, and then instead of having to go through that process every single time of creating this notification section of your run book, right? You just call that run book. Right, so when you get to the end, we'll call that run book. And you can just use that on every, because the data bus will transfer data from the run book to the next run book as well. Mm -hmm. do that. 
Um, and so that's their kind of best practice is to, and, and then when you look at it, it makes a little bit more sense too because you don't have like loops and you know, you know when you start drawing it out on the screen, it's a little easier to understand. Can it run tasks? Can it run parallel tasks as well? Or yeah, yeah. You, you can just simple as simple as it is as you're seeing there. You can just a lot of times you can branch out and just uh, bring something. For example, another whatever. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but yeah. I hope it, I remember not saving it. That, uh, I'm gonna break our environment, but I can just you know, now it's, it doesn't have a lot of space here. But I can I can I can link this one to this one as well, right? And they're gonna start running at the same time. But you have to be careful whenever you have to put them together again. If that makes sense, if that triggers another ten thousand, if depending on what if they work, there they, there could be a junction after that. If they if some of them don't work, it's going to stop there. So there's a little bit of some pitfalls. It's right? easy bringing it back together. Sometimes it can be challenging, right? Depends on what happens. It, it, it never it never comes back, right? But um, yeah, let's send it to the checkout to be sure. As far as monitoring the phone goes, uh, so it, I mean, pull from obviously logs, the logs in the database. Can it pull out those email for specific subjects or files? I believe we can, let me see if we have a monitor here, right? Monitor. We can just monitor an item here. Like yeah. uh, looking at a mailbox for a specific email, specific, specific subject to show up to start the, the, you know, the, the fire. Yeah, because yeah. like yeah, I think you can give it, you can create a mailbox to monitor, to monitor right? Yeah, give it a mailbox to monitor yeah. for a specific oh, format. I think, it's an, I think we have appointments here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure we can add more here. But calendar, I'm for sure for calendar. I'm not 100% sure. Never, oh, okay. never did. But that's the idea. I'm not. It will depend on the integration pack, particularly, mm -hmm. right? I've been using the the one from oh. Operations Manager and and the and the text file. The text file will do that. Will do it. Is that what you're putting in the I text do, file as raw values and then assigning it into your database? Giving it yeah. That's the one. Okay. For example, I use in the customer for uh, importing the data, right? Yeah. So I'm always monitoring a drop-in folder there. So whenever you drop something uh, there, it's going to look for an XML file and the CSV file, put them together and import it automatically into Service Manager. Yeah, okay. it's, that's, that's, that's how, how we're actually yeah, doing that. Yeah. Right. You look at like, you know, new users in Active Directory, right? Yeah. You just do that and say, here's the CSV file, fill this out, yeah. drop it into this directory, boom. And the service itself, is that, where, where's the service actually running? It's running on the orchestrator server? Is that uh, yes. or it's constantly fair. pulling? Yeah, so the run books, there's, uh, as Jordan mentioned, there's two. There's like monitors. Okay. They run all the time. Yeah, that's right. It's and they rough. wait for something to happen to trigger. Uh, and then there's the other ones where they just sit there okay. and you click on run and it runs through once okay. and then it's done. And then it just goes back to your sitting there waiting to you run through again. Yeah, there, there, there's even a command line option yeah, run book, run or whatever, something like that. Or you could give it, if it's an IT, IT personnel, you can give them the, there's an orchestration console, which they, if they have the rights, I'm not sure if I have Silverlight here, but yeah, I'm doing it, yeah. They have like, they can see the run books, whatever they have rights to, and they can just, just click on them and run them, right? It's gonna ask for the parameters, right? If there's something procedure, you could give them this, uh, this uh, console here, and then, for example, whatever, and start run book. Uh, one customer asked me for this. They wanted to give the, the IT people this. That's fine. It's not a. It's not intended for that exactly, but it works, right? And one thing that I use, we, we use. A, I did a, some sort of proof of concept. We ended up not going that path, but it could be done. There's a there's an integration pack for SharePoint, which monitors lists in SharePoint, right? A certain list, and then whenever somebody typed in that form, that it triggers the. Um, uh, the, the run book here in orchestrator and then i can have access to whatever the person typed in the sharepoint form and i can turn that into yeah. whatever i want right i can create a service request sorry link i think we have not to yet. do powershell yeah not yet. We can do PowerShell. yeah because usually it's basically adding those properties to the mailbox and, and well, it's not mailbox whatever but still those zip and all those things to the Right, and uh, so far it's uh, it's it's PowerShell, but it'll very likely be. No, but with link with link <laughs> like one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just one final thing. So I got I got my email as uh, as uh, as myself here.
saying that the user was created, the service request was completed, and give, give, give me all the details, right? So first name, last name, IP, uh, groups that I added. So um, there's a, the OU, there's a user must be all the properties, whatever, of course, whatever I, I have available, I can, I can dump it here in the email. Typically, I would send for some that person's manager saying, oh, here's the, your user is created, it's available, here's the, the default password. I think we said that, so. I don't remember how we said this. So, yeah, uh, I think it's the first name and the year or something like that. Is that, that and where it was created. And if we go to AD, this, it should be there. So, yeah. there we go. I, I think we're set to not enable it. And all the number of names. Okay. Yes, must check password, all the information, organization. Okay. Oh, even, even, the, even the manager that we picked from the list. Right? So that's it. It works. Yep, it works. Um, and the last thing is, you know, we can see like between service manager and service manager, just uh, so you know, is, is minimum three server deployment ideally four or five servers, especially when you get into the self-service portal. You know, you've got a couple SQL databases, you got a couple management servers, you got web services, then you got orchestrator running. Um, and then, you know, if you're using config manager to do software deployment uh, and all these things, it becomes very complex, right? Somewhere in that thing, you know, uh, a, a service stop, the orchestrator service, the action server uh, service, which actually runs the task, that stops, let's say. Right? People can be going in and creating requests all day long and you can be approving those requests all day long in service manager, but that service isn't running and nobody notices that, the automation doesn't run. Everything's approved, everything's set to go. Everything's like, hey, why isn't it working? Right? Why didn't they get that application? Why wasn't that user account created? Um, that's where monitoring kind of comes into play to, to say, hey, you know what? Orchestrator service isn't running. Um, you should probably look at that because all of these things that rely on it are not running now, right? And so when somebody says, "Hey, you know, I, you know, I made a request for an application," you know, well, where along that chain of all those different things that happened, did this thing get hung up? Is it just somebody didn't approve it, or is there something on Config Manager, or is there a permission change, or you know, what is it? And so monitoring kind of becomes key, and that's where Ops Manager kind of comes into play. Um, and there are some things that are new uh, from the Ops Manager of, of, of old, the 2007 version. Uh, another app, uh, acquisition Microsoft made was a company called Avacode. Um, Avacode was a management pack that did .NET and Java monitoring, so application level monitoring. Microsoft bought them, rolled it into SCCM 2012, and, and now it's there out of the box. Um, it's nothing additional that needs to be bought. Um, now with public and private cloud offerings, there's management packs for Azure, for Office 365, and to monitor that Microsoft-based um, private cloud. Uh, improvements to SNMP, uh, improvements in the release of SNMP version three has improved network and Unix and Linux monitoring, um, but also Ops Manager 2012 supports uh, MIB1 and MIB2 standards. So for monitoring network devices, um, we no longer need third-party management packs. It can be done natively out of the box. Um, and there's been some enhancements on the dashboarding side of things to get um, um, better access to, uh, um, to the data and the reporting and the insights uh, that you need. So from a network monitoring perspective, um, you know, previously it was no port up, down. A, it's working, B, it's not working. Um, that's expanded now. We can also, you know, monitor inbound and outbound traffic and utilization and drop rates. Um, with the MIB standards, um, we can look at processor utilization and memory, free memory, memory counters. It says Cisco only. Um, that's not true anymore. There's like a list that they publish every so often of all the different devices that they support as they kind of go through testing. Initially, it was Cisco, um, but it's been expanded out to... Um, uh, to uh, a number of other devices. I think there are almost 2,000 different network devices. Pretty much any, you know, serious enterprise grade network uh, devices um, have that support. Um, and if they don't, um, you know, you can get away and get a lot of information out of SNMP version 3. 
Uh, with the .NET and the Java monitoring and the enhanced network monitoring, we really kind of have an end-to-end -end view, right? Uh, and it's really, um, I think the term Microsoft uses is this holistic view of health. Um, so we've always been good at monitoring you know, the infrastructure, the Windows operating system, SQL, IIS, Exchange, stuff like that. Um, application monitoring now enhanced in you know, looking at the .NET and the, the Java code that's actually executing you know, in those uh, web services. Um, the infrastructure that underlies that, so how are all these different things tied together. Um, and even being able to create um, what they call a, a synthetic transaction and emulate that end user experience so that, you know, it's one thing for the web page to load, but how long does it take to log in to that web page? Um, and being able to create those types of transactions that run on a regular basis, much like a, a, an ops manager rule, so that, you know, we can get, you know, end-to-end performance monitoring of the application. We've all gotten the phone call saying application X is slow. Well, it used to be when application X ran on a single server in the data center that it was fairly easy to figure out because you could log into the server, launch task manager, uh, and see, oh, okay, well, we're running at 99% CPU. Oh, well, that's the reason why application X is slow. You know, maybe we'd restart the service and that would fix everything. Um, but now, you know, we've got remote users who are connecting over who knows what kind of network connectivity through a firewall to a front-end web server that's got network connectivity to an application server, that's got network connectivity to uh, a database server that has some sort of storage connectivity to uh, some sort of SAN. And somewhere in that mix of things, something has gone wrong, and that's why the application is slow. What is it? know is it the code is it storage subsystem is it the user's internet connection you know where where does that issue lie in it? and that's really kind of where this performance monitoring comes into play the other side of this is when we look at it you know we can create these synthetic transactions and we can create baselines we deploy the application we run our baseline and we say okay you know what our maximum response time for this page loading is one second create that synthetic transaction, it runs on a regular basis, and when we see that being exceeded, we can create an alert ops manager. So you know about it before the user calls in and says, hey, the application is slow. Um, the other part of this is then, when we start looking at this stuff, um, I don't know about you, I'm not, a, I'm not a database guy, I'm not a SQL guy, I can run some basic SQL queries, I can install SQL um, and, and things like that, but um, I'm not a SQL guy. Uh, and so, you know, I get an alert from SCOM, uh, I dig into that alert, and I can see that, okay, when the page loads, so now I know that I have a problem with the page loading. It's taking like 16 seconds for a user to log in. Uh, see that right there? 15,987 milliseconds, or 16 seconds for this login to take place. Um, I don't really know what happens there, but, you know, uh, Ops Manager is telling me, well, there's three SQL client calls that happen. The first one is this SQL update, blah, 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 whatever that means. I don't know, I'm not a SQL admin. It's taking 42 milliseconds. Yeah. Seems reasonable. Again, I don't know SQL, but 42 milliseconds is pretty quick. The next one there, SQL exec process, log on, username, blah, 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 again, bunch of gobbledygook to me. 15.87 seconds. Hmm. Guess where the problem is. And having worked in the development shop, where I was the IT guy for a software development company, the typical response that you'll get from a developer, wow, it's got to be infrastructure. Yeah. It probably needs more CPU or more RAM because it works perfectly fine on my highly optimized machine that I've tweaked the living crap out of to get this SQL to run just perfectly smooth, right? Now it's just like, well, listen. It might run perfectly fine on your machine. Here's the issue, right? And you can give that to them and you can say, this is what the problem is. It is a SQL problem. It is not a resource contention thing because I've got all my SQL performance logs um, in Ops Manager. I can see that performance is just fine, but this SQL query <coughs> is taking an abnormally long amount of time. And so I don't have to you know, get into that argument. This is what the problem is and I can hand that off. Um, it requires a little bit of understanding. I mean, 
this is a fairly simple one, but you know, as Andrew can probably uh, fill you in a little bit more when we're hiring for like knock analysts, uh, it's the opposite of hiring a consultant. You know, we hire a consultant like Jose who knows a lot about SCOM and Service Manager and Hyper-V, doesn't know much about Config Manager, um, knows what he needs to know about Active Directory, but he needs to know about Active Directory. We're not gonna send him on a, an exchange or a link deployment, so that's not his area of expertise. On the knock analyst side of things, they don't need to know every little bit about Exchange, but they need to know Exchange, they need to know SQL, they need to know Active Directory, they need to know Link. So when these alerts come in, they can decide whether or not this is a real issue or it's not. And if it is a real issue, what are some of the sort of things that we should be taking a look at? Because if this is taking 15.8 seconds, you know, what could be the cause of that and sort of trying to, to, to classify that? Right, this came from SCOM or Service Manager? Or this is all SCOM. This is all SCOM alerting. So this is when you kind of drill into the, uh, the performance monitors within SCOM. This is some of the information that's used to be. So, so this will generate an alert in, in SCOM because obviously we've exceeded our thresholds and this has created an alert. And as we drill into that alert, we can start to see bit by bit exactly what's happening at that level. So previous to 2012, if you didn't buy Avacode, you wouldn't actually see this. You would know that there's a problem in SQL, but you wouldn't know, is it performance, is it query, is it application, like where, what's causing the issue? So you get that, that in-depth um, in knowledge now. Um, and then when we look at the performance, you know, again, you've got dashboards. So when we see that alert pop up, pull up the dashboard, performance-wise, you know, we'll see CPU, memory, disk utilization, disk I.O is what we expect, it's along our baseline, but you know, we can you know, quickly determine whether it is, you know, where that issue lies. And so I'm gonna um, hand things over to, uh, uh, to Andrew now, and Andrew's gonna kinda take us through operations manager dashboard, some of the features and functionality that are some of the things that, uh, that he's picked up from the IG side of things, so Andrew, I'll... Uh, Okay, so those that, how many people have used SCUM before or are familiar with SCUM? Okay, so pretty much everyone in the room. So 2012 console is pretty much the same as the other system center uh, consoles, and has the same kind of look. On the left hand side, we've just created some custom views that we use within the infrastructure guardian team. So we have one specifically for new alerts, under investigation, pending alerts, etc., for customers. Uh, if we just click in the closed alerts, we should see quite a lot for the last couple of days. So these are some of the alerts that have uh, come through just recently. Now as part of the IG service, um, if I just scroll down to some of these, if we take, for example, the logical disk transfer alert that we have here. So in a customer's environment, they may get that alert come in during backups. Um, so it may be normal we see that in the evening. So one of the things we'll do with the IG service is if we get this alert, we'll actually go in and look at the performance view. And we can actually look at the trending then for that particular um, disk latency to see whether it's normal for that time of the day. Just bring that one up here. We'll look at Q length in this case. And percentage idle time. So we can actually see the, uh, the trends. Um, we can go in and look at the time range. So here it's over the last three hours. We can look at it over the last three days. And then we can start to see patterns um, in some cases, depending on uh, you know, whether it's a backup job. So if it is an alert that we have to notify the customer about, then we would you know, make a, an email or a phone call if it was something out of the ordinary. So uh, that's just one of the things we, uh, we do as part of the performance monitoring. Um, distributed applications, if you've used SCOM, you've probably seen this before, so it sort of gives you a hierarchy view of, of the health, either of um, something like Active Directory, um, or it could be that you've actually got a custom application within your organization or SharePoint, um, and you want to look at the overall health uh, for that particular app. So we'll look at Active Directory, for example, um, go in and look at the diagram view. I'm always at the end of the day for this demo, and Jose always uses the SQL resources for everything else. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So in this case, everything is healthy, um, but you can look at the whole topology of if AD, uh, the different site services and servers that are affected. So if we do have an issue with an AD server, we can actually drill down and see where the particular problem is. Um, you see how some of those objects link together too with the, uh, the blue dashed lines? Yeah. How, they, how they relate, I guess, logically. Yeah. How do you decide what goes into a distributed application? Is it just all automated or can you customize it? So something like if the SharePoint and you're using the SharePoint management pack, um, a lot of that um, it will discover the servers that make up SharePoint. Um, and then you just have to do the configuration of maybe, like Roddy mentioned, a synthetic transaction for a SharePoint site. Right. So we have some customers where they've got like an HR site and we have a run as account that will log in, do a basic lookup of a, a user within the organization and make sure that the results come back. So that part of it, we actually script within SCON. Um, it's almost like a screen capture where you go in and sort of click, load up the web page, click next, 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 and it'll just keep running that synthetic transaction. Um, if you have a custom app or you want to get down to the real specifics, then kind of like the service manager, you need to do some planning in terms of what components and services make up that particular application. Yeah, so you could. For someone like us yeah. managing like multiple exchange environments, can I split up? Exchange will discover everything. Right. Yeah. You and create one large distributed app. application, and then you go in and you create your own. And it's again, it's much like Dizio, right? You're going to drag on your exchange okay. objects, and then you'll select. By default, it's going to select all exchange, right? And you'll just select, okay, this server is, you know, this maybe it's one server, but you've got two databases on that server for different customers, right? And you just specify the component. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a good map of, of all the components that make up the app, then you can do it. Um, it can get quite complex as well. I know I think Jose, you did one right for a customer yeah, where it was. So we think a lot of like a web application basically. Yeah. So we created a syntactic, syntactic transaction to, to give it a general view, like the, the response time for that bank in general. But we that was just one one piece of the distributed application. So there was the SQL servers, the servers themselves, and all that was part of the, the total. So and. We're actually monitoring the transaction, the, the syntactic transaction, and, and the application as a whole, and making those dashboards and, and, and response time and availability for that. So. Um, we have one here, which I just added again, performance view. This is a basic synthetic transaction we've got here for the, the dev site at CMS. Um, I just set that up today, just give it a second to load. So here it gives sort of me the last three hours um, what the response time is for that particular application. So again, there's a couple of uh, peaks and lows in there. Now we have, um, just see, there's no alerts for that particular one at this time, but we have a customer that has a SharePoint app, runs on 2003, I think, um, and it has an inherent problem where occasionally it'll trip up and the SharePoint site becomes unavailable. Um, and for that particular customer, they had a support contract with a vendor that would have to connect in and support that server. And basically it was costing them like 200 bucks to restart the IIS services. So we put that within SCOM. So when we start seeing the response time exceed 20 seconds in a particular case, then we have um, a job that will go and reset the IIS on the server. Um, and that sort of runs 24 seven. And normally by the time we see the alerts within SCOM, it's already remediated it. So um, simple tests, I mean, you could do it within Scorch, like uh, Rodney had mentioned, but some of the, the simple remediation you can do within, within SCARM as well. Um, yeah, one thing you'll note is we send, you know, a lot of these components have some basic functionality. So like they're basic, very, very basic incident management. In, in this. You can take an alert and open it up and you can assign it to somebody, right? And that person will get an email, but there's no sort of history and there's no, you know, escalation and, and things like that. That's a, a service manager. So we see a lot of those sort of individual pieces. Um, service manager really kind of enhances all that. Um, so management packs here, obviously a lot of people are using SCON, so you're familiar with the whole management pack concept. Just a couple of best practices if you're not already using them. Um, the option on the right hand side to basically download a management pack, it connects to a Microsoft catalog, kind of like the Windows update. You can type in SharePoint and it'll tell you if there's a, a new SharePoint management pack example available. Um, best practice is probably not to use that because it will download it, it will install it, but typically there's a whole bunch of other configuration that has to be done either before you install the management pack or post MP install. 
Um, so if you're not familiar with the management pack, then typically either it won't work, um, or you'll be under the assumption that it is monitoring when in fact it hasn't discovered any of your SharePoint file. So most of the time, unless you know it's a management pack, you know what the configuration is. Um, we don't recommend that people use the download of the catalog, actually go to the Microsoft site, download, it's normally an MSI, along with a Word doc of, of how to install. So it's just a good thing that happens is if you uh, do that. Some of them are pretty are safe, but mostly you should, you should end up going to yeah. go against your best practice. Yeah. But I think that's the best practice. But uh, the big ones like Exchange, for example, it's just uh, if you import it and you didn't set the proxy on the agent, for example, yep. you're going to lose the first, and then it's going to complain, and you do it, and you have to wait another four or eight hours when you have a management pack, so they get, things get discovered. Otherwise, if you have prepared, you would discover it right away. Right? So sometimes people, it's not working. Well, it is working as expected. Right? So, but it takes yeah. four hours, eight to hours, discover. Yeah. Well, how long how is to discover? Yeah. If there's also a, a time delay in between Microsoft releasing the management pack and it being available on download.microsoft.com and it actually showing up in the catalog. And that time gap can be like months. So you go into yeah. the thing here in SCOM, you say, well, hey, look, oh, there's the latest one. I have the latest one. I have the latest management pack. Um, you probably don't because it just hasn't been published there yet. Um, one of the other things with mon or importing new management packs is be the first one. <laughs> yes. So we had a few good examples of that from customers. Wait, <laughs> wait a little bit or you know, search the forums and see what other people have discovered because um, it was a SQL management pack upgrade, had a typo um, that basically you could have a hundred terabytes of free space on your transaction log drive and it would say you had zero. And you'd get a gazillion alerts from every SQL instance and every SQL server you have within your organization saying, hey, you got zero free space in your transaction log drive. The exchange is worse. The exchange yeah. is worse because they cover corrupt mailboxes. So, yeah. wait. So definitely don't be the first one to manage your practice. Yeah. And often when there is bugs like that, it can take, um, I think with the SQL one, it was like four or five months before it was fixed. So um, you have to then uninstall it hopefully you have a copy of your previous management pack. So another best practice is back up your overrides. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one thing with the IG service is that we do test, obviously, a lot of the management packs, the main ones that come out of Microsoft before we deploy them. So uh, we always hang off, especially and cumulative updates as well that come out for SCOM. So we normally do recommendations of uh, once we finish our testing before customers deploy them. Uh, this is an example of a custom report, actually, that Joe Say worked on for a, a customer. Um, so again, something that we offer in the IG service, if you want something specific, uh, we can often provide that for you as well. Um, in this particular case, I think the customer, they didn't want to deploy ACS, which is audit collection services. It's another piece of SCUM, which basically monitors security logs on domain controllers, servers, looking for specific events, mm -hmm. but um, requires quite a bit of SQL power. So this particular customer, it was a small environment, and they just wanted to know when user accounts were created within AD. So um, I guess in this case, you're saying you're looking for specific events, 624, 4720, and then he's created a custom report which lists um, new accounts created in that, that period. So that's just an example of uh, a custom report that you can create in SCUM. Uh, just gonna quickly switch to another system. So how many people have actually deployed SP1 of 2012 for SCOM. One, okay. Are you using it for network monitoring at the moment? Uh, we're just getting started, I believe. Okay. With, uh, with the number of stuff. Okay. So one of the big improvements for the, for the networking piece is basically um, if, if you've got a distributed application and you're monitoring it, obviously you can throw in your networking components as well, so specific ports, router switches that may affect that application. And then if you do have perform an issue, performance issues or issues with that app affected by that particular switch or router, you can then go to the networking team and you sort of have hard evidence to say that you know, this switch has got high CPU, high memory when we're having these particular issues. Yeah, one of the things that I mean, like when we're 
discussions with customers, right? And the network guys are like, no, 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 I've got this tool. And this tool, you know, goes down to the packet layer and I can see every little bit of data that's being transmitted across the network. And that's the tool I use. And this is crap because this doesn't give me that. Um, it's not really meant as a tool to replace it. It's like there's tools for SQL and Active Directory and all that kind of stuff. It's meant to say, hey, you got a problem over here. Here's what we think it is, right? And then use those tools to kind of drill down and find out, you know, exactly what that issue is, and and uh, uh, and, you know, and, and work on remediating it. Well, it's pretty pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Nice big pie graphs with colors and 3D, and just you know, looks good for the boss. Look, here's the problem. Match the problems over here, but look at these pretty pictures. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Everything's <Yeah>. green. Makes it look green. Yeah, that's yeah. green. <laughs> So this is an example so here of a... This is a, this is a managed bug pack for the Cisco? Or like a so no, this, so so this is um, standard out of... Yeah. 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 No, it's okay. So yeah, in 2007, they didn't have the networking piece. It had to be a third-party management pack. Yeah, okay. And then in 2012, they introduced yeah. the, the network monitoring. Mm -hmm. And it seems to improve with each update that they, they have. Um, so this is just an example here. We've got a switch um, on the left-hand side. There's two particular devices that are connected to it. Gives us some historical data of uptime, uh, response time, etc. as well. Um, status of the ports, you know, basic in out traffic. And then it won't show up here, but basically there is an option. Uh, you can select a number of hops or, or show all computers as well. Um, and it will show you the computers that are connected to that particular switch. Uh, if we do a right click on uh, this one here. So you can actually get down and display the specific ports that may be affected. So um, again, another best practice with this is if when you first connect to switch and discover it within SCOM, um, it will only start monitoring ports that are actually active and have something connected to them. So if there's nothing connected, then the monitoring will be disabled by default on that port. So if you were to connect something later, then there'll be no monitoring. You have to go in and specifically turn it on. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind um, as well. Otherwise, you might be under the impression you're monitoring all imports when in fact you, you're not. Um, so this is actually pretty good because you can go down to, the, say, the port level and say to the networking folks, you know, I'm having an issue with the switch on this particular port with, with this server. The same way if you've got like a VM um, using you know, a virtual machine manager, it will detect like all the VMs, which switches they're connected to and sort of or map out um, you know, which servers are connected to which switch. That's uh, another, another good feature for, for 2012. Just, come back in here. Just gonna quickly go back to the monitoring tab. So there is a connector, and I'm not sure if Rodney showed you that earlier, between SCOM and Service Manager. Oh, we talked about it. Okay. So you can see down the right-hand side here where we've got the, the ticket IDs. Now, in a normal environment, if you've got SCOM on-premise with Service Manager, you can have that connector set up so when an incident gets created, it will generate an incident within Service Manager. If you have a lot of noise in your environment, um, you haven't done all your tuning correctly, um, then quickly you'll have you know, potentially hundreds or thousands of incidents within Service Manager. So this works a little bit different um, for customers that have the infrastructure guardian service. These ticket numbers are actually coming from the IG service manager instance. So we actually have like a three-way special connector which sits on the customer SCOM server. We have a secure connection on our side. And as an incident gets raised on the customer SCOM, it generates a ticket number on our side before the customer even gets to see it. And for those customers that do have service manager, uh, if we need to escalate it to them, then only at that point do we escalate it and it creates a service manager incident on the customer side. So that way you're only getting incidents that are basically you no know, need investigating or actually valid. Um, and let's say that three-way connector we have then connects two service manager instances and the SCOM instance all together and keeps all three in, uh, in sync. So yeah, that's just a little bit about uh, the three-way connector. Uh, I'll just show you some dashboards here as well. I'm not going to show you the live ones just because we have uh, customer names on them. 
But essentially, one of the other questions we get asked quite a lot is, what happens if SCON goes down? Who's monitoring SCON? Um, which is a good question. In 2012, it's a bit more redundant. You can have multiple management servers now in that pool as opposed to having individuals like an RMS server, how it used to be. Um, but you can still have issues. So we again have a, the third party connector that we have monitors the state of the, the management server. So if there's a, a particular problem, it goes gray and stop monitoring, we'll get an alert within, within an alarm and knock. So that is to that. Uh, the same thing with dead agents or critical agents that are no longer communicating back to, to SCOM. So we get those uh, notifications back in the, in the NOC as well. Um, if you don't have that, similar to the accounts for service manager and orchestrator, things just stop working and you might think your environment's healthy, but meanwhile SCOM is not generating any alerts. So that's uh, something we keep on uh, top of. And then this is just, I quickly show you this as well. Um, we kind of have a map with our customers, and this gets updated every minute. Uh, we get to see the trends over our customers. We're pulling, again, this data out of Service Manager. It's a combination of Service Manager and SCOM data. Um, and it'll sort of show us if a customer's having a peak or they're starting to have a lot of alerts on one particular day. Um, we can maybe quickly identify that there's something unusual going on within their uh, environment. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on, on SCOM or the IG service? Or is everybody thirsty waiting for a drink? <laughs> You're in the way. Okay, I'll hand it back to Rodney. <laughs> So a couple things, uh, quickly a couple best practices. Uh, as Andrew kind of um, mentioned, you know, a lot of the management packs require configuration and just because you've implemented a management pack doesn't mean you're monitoring anything. Uh, I've got in, you know, when I was in the field going into a, uh, into a site and they're having problems with exchange or something like that. Um, and there was, well, there's something wrong with Ops Manager because it's not telling us what's wrong with exchange. I went in there and I had the management pack for Exchange 2010 deployed, but they didn't have any discovery done. It wasn't looking at any servers. It didn't know any Exchange servers existed because discovery by default is disabled. So they just imported the management pack and thought everything was good. Um, and there's very few management packs that are like that. You know, the basic you know Active Directory type of management packs, the core Windows operating system management packs, those are simple to deploy and start monitoring. Um, but uh, you know, as things get more complex, it's um, uh, it becomes more difficult. Um, there is some fairly powerful reporting, and again, because it's based on SQL reporting services, you know, Excel, third-party tools like Crystal Reports, the SR SSRS web service, um, and even dashboards and the ability to build custom dashboards within Service Manager really kind of allows you to get that data um, where you want it. Even taking those um, uh, web parts from SSRS and publishing them to, uh, to SharePoint is, uh, is possible. Uh, and like any sort of enterprise monitoring tool, um, they're noisy and they require constant tuning. Um, I think, you know, we found, you know, on, on average, you've got about a 100 to 1 signal to noise ratio for, um, for enterprise monitoring tools in general. I remember the first time I deployed MOM 2005 and I came in like the next day and there was like 3,000 alerts or something like that. Um, the rules are very generic based on Microsoft best practices, right? So. 10% free disk space. You need to have 10% free disk space. Well, yeah, that's fine. You know, if I've got a 10 gig drive, you know, that's one gig of space. And that's reasonable. If I've got a two terabyte drive, you know, that's 200 gigabytes of free space. That's a lot of free space to just have sitting there because Microsoft says it's the best practice, right? And so um, we can tune those things out. And maybe you've got a 160 gig drive in there and it's sitting at 155 gigs but it's sitting at 155 gigs for three years. It never changes, it never goes up, it never goes down. Um, you know, we can tune those kinds of alerts out and, and, and get that lower. I mean, I know Andrew and, and the guys in the NOC, they're constantly tuning um, you know, alerts and, and tuning out the noise at, at various different environments because it's different in every environment. One thing you might tune out in your environment is something that you know, another environment is looking at you know, as, as sort of a, a, you know, a major metric that they want to track. Uh, and so that's, um, 
that's something that sort of comes into play. And that's, you know, one of the things with, you know, infrastructure garden, when you look at, you know, monitoring um, throughout the stack from the bottom to the top, um, tuning out the noise, um, and really kind of giving you the information that you need. Um, this is kind of a high level architectural diagram of how it works. It's a, uh, hopefully you can follow it. Um, you have an on-premise management server. Um, there's a secure um, uh, two-way handshake uh, to the uh, IMG, IG um, bridge uh, that sits uh, in our, uh, on our network uh, and reports into our service manager where the NOC team filters out the noise um, and when it does find a, a specific uh, alert um, through a virtual desktop, uh, they'll, um, they'll R, uh, sorry, VPN in and RDP in to uh, uh, look at things like event logs and get a little bit more information and sort of build up a package of, you know, this is a real problem. Here's what we think it is. Here's some potential solutions and then create that incident in your ticketing system and pass that off to the appropriate individual. Um, there's also reporting done. I think there's um, sample reports in the um, uh, there's sample reports in the, in the in the folder there of kind of what you get on a monthly basis. And we can talk to Andrew about that a little bit more. Uh, basically, those reports are like you know here's what we think you should be focusing on in the next 30, 60, 90 days, uh, as well as anything that you might want. Where you say, hey, you know what? we uh, we need trend analysis for the last six months on our file server. You know, call up Andrew. You know, an hour later, I'll have the, uh, the report drawn from Ops Manager and send that off to you, showing that, oh, you know, over the last six months, you know, your file server's gone from 100 gigs of free space to 50 gigs of free space. And based on that, you know, in the next six months, you're going to be out of disk space. So you can kind of get that trend analysis. Um, just to quickly summarize, um, you know, self-service, um, you know, for all aspects of the organization as possible with service management. There are little individual self-service components here and there with various different system center pieces, but the real, you know, powerful self-service and automation uh, service delivery piece is a service manager um, piece um, and an orchestrator piece. That being said, you know, orchestrator can be used just quickly and easily to kind of um, pick off that low hanging fruit and start to free up resources for those larger projects. So rather than spending half your day logging into servers and restarting services and running scripts, you can actually look at, um, you know, doing, uh, 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 enhancing sort of what the different um, uh, uh, services that IT can provide. Uh, and then with this, you know, monitoring is, is key to, um, to this, whether or not you're using the full system center suite. Um, you know, SCOM is typically one of the first things we see when we go into a, a net new customer who has no system center and wants to, you know, start taking advantage of the capabilities. SCOM and Config Manager are the, are the first two things that, uh, that we typically look at. And so with that, um, we've got time for questions. I know there's beer and wine and snacks out there, so we can take the questions out there. Um, and uh, I'd like to just thank everybody for spending the day with us. There are um, also in those little folders, there's like a, an eval form. Um, if you could fill that out um, and uh, just leave it on the desk here. Uh, Angelica, will, um, uh, Angelica will pick those up and uh, if you've got any questions, you want any, any sort of follow up, um, just leave a note on there and, uh, and we can uh, follow up with you afterwards. But other than that, I'd like to say thanks for spending the day with us and uh, Enjoy the rest of the evening.